We cut to the day of the rocket launch and we see a cleaned up Hank Henshaw attending. As the launch begins, electronics in Henshaw's wheelchair cause the guidance system to go haywire and the rocket goes wildly off course. Clark sees the crisis breaking on the news and hesitates only briefly before he suits up and flies to the rescue. While Superman helps to evacuate the pilots, we see that the nuclear core of the rocket has become unstable. Superman is taking the rocket into space when the core finally explodes, and the world looks on as Superman survives the blast. When he returns, his reception is mixed. He's met with some praise, but there are just as many people who are afraid of him. This is tough for Clark because even when he tries to help, the people still fear him. In the Batcave, Bruce watches Superman's rescue on the news while he waits for Lex's files to decrypt. He's not having a nightmare of a dystopian future with an evil Superman and flying demon bug things. And he's certainly not having a dream within a dream about the Flash giving him some convoluted bullshit about Lois Lane being special. Or something. Where was I? Oh yeah, Bruce is watching Superman's rescue on the news. But the only thing he takes away from it is that Superman can survive even a nuclear blast. Eventually, the files are decrypted, and he sees the early experiments Lex's people are doing with the kryptonite. The experiments show that the kryptonite is highly toxic to Kryptonian physiology. It's clear that Lex intended for him to steal the files and discover the kryptonite's effects. Bruce considers the implications that kryptonite could be used to weaken or even kill Superman. But at this point, Bruce is still hesitant to actually take a life, because he's Batman. And Batman's one thing is that he doesn't kill people. Now, there are several examples of Batman offing people in the comics. But for Batman to have an arc in this story, we need to see him push to the very edge and then decide what kind of hero he really is. Meanwhile, Lois gets in touch with General Swanwick and asks about KG Beast. Swanwick recognizes the tattoo and tells her that he's a mercenary who was most likely working for a private company. And Lois wonders what the fire could have accomplished. In Gotham, Victor Zaz's bail gets posted by KG Beast, who tails him home and then beats him severely before killing him with a batarang. In Metropolis, Superman shows up outside Lois's window. It admits that he doesn't know what to do about the people's fear of him. She tells him that people fear what they don't know. She reminds him that the House of El stands for hope and that the world needs to know what he stands for. Which is better advice than saying, Be their monument, be their angel. Be anything they need you to be, or be none of it. You don't owe this world a thing. Because while that sounds important, it actually means nothing. They're interrupted by a breaking news report about Zaz's death, with Batman being the chief suspect. Clark goes to leave with a determined look on his face, and Lois asks where he's going. He answers, to show the world what Superman stands for. That's when we get our scene at the Capitol. And this version has absolutely no mason jars of urine in it. Superman addresses the people's fear of him and his intentions. He says that... I'm here to help. That he stands for truth and justice. And to show everyone what that means, he says that he will apprehend the dangerous vigilante known as the Batman. Trying to show the world and himself that Superman is a beacon of hope and righteousness is a better motivation than, Hey, I've got your mom. Go kill this guy or she dies. And considering that Superman could tell whenever Lois was in trouble, it's kind of hard to imagine that he dropped the ball when it came to his own mother. In the Batcave, Alfred comes in and turns on Superman at the congressional hearing. In Bruce's mind, Batman is in the right. To him, his actions are not only justified, but necessary. So when he hears that Superman is coming for him, he sees it as the beginning of Superman turning on humanity. Bruce tells Alfred that he intends to steal the kryptonite to use against Superman. And the scene plays out pretty much the same as the original version. This scene perfectly showed off Bruce's cynicism, balanced out by Alfred's pragmatism. He has the power to wipe out the entire human race, and if we believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. And we have to destroy him. But he is not our enemy. The only difference is that Bruce cites Superman surviving a nuclear explosion to illustrate how dangerous he can be. So he breaks into Luther Corp's warehouse, takes out the security, and steals the kryptonite. Uh, 
This moment shows how well Lex has manipulated the situation. By forcing Clark to act, Clark has, in turn, forced Bruce to act, which leaves no time for anyone to think rationally about what they're doing. After Clark leaves for the hearing, Lois gets to work and follows Swanwick's leads. Though she can't prove it, she figures out that KG Beast was most likely working for Lex Luthor. She realizes that the fire at the Daily Planet and the runaway rocket were done to draw Superman back into the spotlight. In his lab, Lex uses Clark's DNA and fingerprints to make biometrics that match Kal-El. Meanwhile, Superman is flying over Gotham when he spots the bat signal. He lands in Crime Alley, and the world's finest square off. Now when they fight each other, they have, from their point of view, rock-solid motivations for doing so. Superman is trying to establish to the world that he's the kind of man that will stand up for justice. And Batman is trying to avert another tragedy like the Kryptonian fight. This moment should feel bittersweet. Both of them are trying to do what they think is right. And both of them are a little right. And a little wrong. The fight goes fairly the same as the original. But in this version, when Batman has Superman down, he isn't bloodthirsty and he doesn't taunt him. You are never a god. You are never even a man. In fact, he's agonizing over the decision to kill him. Remember, this version of Batman hasn't killed anyone. Ever. So to do so in cold blood is pretty tough for him. He actually tries to convince Superman that he's too dangerous to be left alive. And we realize that Bruce is trying to convince himself as much as he's trying to convince Superman. He brings up the thousands dead and that they're all on Superman's head. And it works. We've seen that Clark blames himself for all of the victims of the Kryptonian fight. And we've seen how guilty he's felt. So when Batman lays it all out for him, he agrees. He says, you're right. I am responsible. The world is safer without me. Do it. Kill me. In this moment, Clark finally realizes that right and wrong aren't absolute, and that sometimes to do what's right, sacrifices need to be made. At the same time, Superman's selflessness affects Bruce. Seeing a man willing to sacrifice his life based on the theory that the world will be safer shows him that people can be altruistic, and that, just like Alfred said, Superman is not our enemy. I'm not even going to go into the other way the fight went. You're letting him kill Martha. Why did you say that name? The two heroes then part ways. Batman throws away the kryptonite and Superman flies away, leaving both of them to think on what their encounter meant. From there, we cut to Lex Luthor at the Fortress of Solitude. It's revealed that the entire conflict between Superman and Batman was one big distraction designed to keep the world's greatest superheroes focused on each other so they wouldn't interfere with his plan. He uses the manufactured biometrics to enter the fortress and access all of its data banks. The process of absorbing all that knowledge causes Lex to lose his hair, and the scene ends with him laughing maniacally, saying, I understand, over and over. Back in Metropolis, Lois tracks KGBs down and gets him arrested. A few weeks later, Clark arrives at a meeting with Bruce. He still wonders if the world is better off without him. Bruce tells him that the world needs his hope, his faith in people, and that Batman needs it too. Clark is taken aback by the admission, but before he can say anything, Bruce also reminds him that he'll need Batman's experience in the coming years. We see that because they've given each other a more balanced perspective on the world, that the two of them sort of agree to disagree on how they do things. They also agree that they might come across threats that are more dangerous than either one of them can handle alone. So if one ever needs the other's help, they'll be there. So, that's how I would fix 2016's Batman vs. Superman. Are there any movies that you think are in need of repair? 
If so, email me at the link down below or post a comment. And remember to click like and subscribe if you want to see more movies get fixed. Until next time, I'm Mr. Fixit for Fix the Flick.